Good morning, Grace Church. How are we doing today? Good. A little rainier outside than we were hoping it was going to be for a Memorial Day weekend. Kills all the barbecues. So, but thank you for joining us today. And on Memorial Day, I just wanted to read a little something. We've got a video to go as well to honor those who have fallen in service. Memorial Day is a single day that we have set aside for those who of us who have benefited from the freedoms protected by the lives of so many soldiers given for it. It is often quoted that freedom isn't free, but most will never really feel the weight of that statement unless they have stood next to the coffin of someone who has lost their lives to pay that price. Unless they have held the hand of somebody grieving or held them as they trembled with grief with tears pouring down from their loss. Some of us have been there and seen that price paid and grieved with them. Memorial Day is for those Gold Star families who have lost their loved ones in the pursuit of freedom for all of us. Their lives were not spent for their own glory or honor. They were not searching for a violent end to prove their own strength, but to show their love for those that they left behind. Jesus is recorded in John 15, 12 through 13, saying, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. That no one, sorry, greater love has no one than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. This is why so many of our soldiers have gone off to war and sacrificed their own lives for those of us that left behind, for their friends and their families. It is for love that they were willing to offer their lives, praying that their offering will help secure future a peace and hope for those that they left behind, that they loved and carried with them into danger. Winston Churchill was right when he stated, we sleep safely at night because rough men and women stand ready to visit violence on those who would do us harm. So today let's pay proper respect and honor to those who have lost their lives in pursuit of freedom and the families that they have left behind and those that have given what Abraham Lincoln called the last full measure of devotion to us and their country. Is there anybody here who's lost a, a close relative in combat or in war? No. Anybody knows anybody that's been lost in, in war? Okay. I just want to give my heartfelt gratitude for you and for everybody else that's out there that might be watching that's lost a loved one. As somebody who stood shoulder to shoulder, to shoulder with soldiers that have lost their lives in combat, thank you.
Please rise. You may be seated. So it is the fifth Sunday of the month, and during the fifth Sunday of the month, uh, we have decided that we are going to have a missionary moment so that throughout the year we are uh, remembering our missionaries. So at this time, we're going to have Laura come up, and she is going to talk about our missionary moment for today. All right, guys. So it is time for our missionary moment. I know we don't do them as often as maybe we would like to, but just a short reminder to keep you guys thinking about our missionaries who are overseas or here at home, just all the work that they do. So today's video is from Christy Hofer. I have to say this video was recorded a little while ago, so she does say March, but with all of the things that we had scheduled for the Faith Promise Drive, we couldn't fit her in. But we now get to show her to you, and she has a great little video for you guys. One of her things regarding her prayer request for the director of the Media Center has changed. I encourage you to check out your newsletter or the missions boards because they have been updated with the new information, and you can see exactly what has transpired regarding that prayer request. So if you would go ahead and show her video. Hello, Grace Baptist Church. I hope that this March finds you all doing well. I'm here on the campus of the Malaga Media Center in Malaga, Spain, where I work. In previous videos that I've sent to you over the years, I have shown you our campus and even walked around the local lake with you. And I was um, this this year kind of a run amuck of ideas to do something new. So I thought I'll just sit and I'll talk to them. Uh, we have had, as you all have the same, a very interesting 2020. And yet despite being quarantined in our homes here in Spain for 10 whole weeks, uh, we actually were able to get quite a lot of production done. We were able to use stock footage to make films that still reached our audience in North Africa. And so many people, I think in part because of just the, um, the huge amount of ambiguity that grew in their lives, reached out to us and wanted to initiate conversations about the Bible and about Jesus. In fact, the year 2020 saw us connecting twice as many people from North Africa to a local church. So there were six individuals in the year 2019 that contacted us and asked to know more about the Lord, came to know Christ as their Savior through those conversations with us, and then we enabled them to find a local uh, community of believers. Whereas in 2020, that number went from six to 12 which was so extremely exciting for us. Our Arabic staff field several hundred calls and texts in the course of just one month. And not all of those individuals are looking to know Jesus. Some of those folks contact us purely for the goal to uh, try to convert us to Islam and many to attack. They have called our Arabic staff terrible names, vulgar names. And yet every day that those staff have to decide okay, is this person trying to cover up fear? Is there any interest way down below the surface there? Is it worth continuing to talk to this person? 
And sometimes people who are initially aggressive, as you stay on the line with them, will uh, turn softer in tone until eventually they do reveal, they have real questions that they want to ask. Some things you can pray for uh, on our behalf would, one, be that or our director and his wife, Sue, who have been with us for a year and a half, have decided it's necessary to go back to the States and retire. Uh, we knew that they wouldn't be with us for, for eons of time, but we'd hoped it would be longer than the year and a half we've had them. Sue has some terrible health issues that she needs to deal with in the States, and it's, it's time, being there over 65, to retire. So a prayer request would be that the Lord would guide the next director here to the MMC. We really need someone at the helm. This is a large ship to steer. And so if you would ask the Lord to provide the right person in his timing for us, that would be just wonderful. Of course, the health of our members here on staff is always something that we can ask you to take to the Lord. We have an individual who fights Crohn disease. Um, we have a, um, one couple who haven't been with us for months because they had to go back to their home country and pursue treatment for some terrible pinched nerve pain, um, neck issues as well. And then um, others of us really struggle with digestive issues. Um, one gal here on the team has lost 20 pounds over the course of a few months, has seen multiple specialists, both here and in Canada, and no doctor seems to know precisely what the issue is and how she can heal her uh, digestive system. So um, whenever you're wondering how to pray for us here in Malika, just know that our health is something we'd always love for you to mention to the Lord for us. A concept that's very hard for the average North African to grasp is the, uh, the theological truth of unconditional love, how God has uh, completely restored us to himself through Jesus Christ, and that nothing that we do can damage or destroy that love he has for us and that position we have as his children. And so just this last week, we filmed a story of a father and a son who are painting a room in their house and when the father's out of sight the young boy starts going at it with the paint on the walls and there ends up being a little bit of a spill well when dad comes back to see this mess you'd expect to find him very angry but of course this was our opportunity to show our north african audience what it looks like for a loving father to have completely unconditional love not based on what we do and so that film is currently being edited. Uh, we would love your prayers as it goes out on the internet for it to reach individuals who need to understand the completely unconditional love of our Father God. Well, I had better get going. It was so good talking with you all. Blessings on you. Till next time. We're going to take a moment here and pray for Christy and the ministry there at the Malaga Media Center. Father, I thank you for people who are willing to listen to your call and use the gifts that you have uniquely gifted them with to be able to do things that many of us cannot do. And I praise you for the opportunity to be able to support these people. We ask that you would be with Christy and, and her team and the staff that's over there. We just pray that you would grant them with good health, that you would protect them physically, emotionally, spiritually. Lord, I ask that you would be with them. We pray specifically for this video that they're getting ready to put out, Lord, Lord, this video on unconditional love, which is a concept that many are unfamiliar with and is hard to grasp. And Lord, I pray that you would help them to be able to see the truth of your word as they watch this video. I pray that you would just communicate this to them. Lord, help the center as they take phone calls and emails and text messages as they try to answer them and be discerning in the responses to give. Lord, I ask you to just grant your mercies to them, grant your wisdom to them. Continue to be with them, Lord, and watch over them all. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. That is a very important ministry course as they're reaching millions and millions of people there from that media center. So do continue to keep them in your prayers if you could. Today is Memorial Day. Eric, thank you for putting that together for us and the worship team. We appreciate what you guys have done with that. Before we get started with the message, there's a few things that we want to draw your attention to. In your bulletin this morning, you're going to see just a couple things on the back of that. There's a hymn sing this afternoon. It's a beautiful rainy day. It's liquid sunshine today, and we need it desperately. But it's also a good day to be inside worshiping together as a church family. And I know you can't go golfing. I know you can't go fishing. Well, you can go fishing. I'm not going to go fishing. They won't let me go fishing. They say, i got to be here. So if i got to be here, you got to be here. Well, 
It's not completely true, but if you guys can come this afternoon, we'd love to have you worship with us at 4 o'clock. It's going to be about an hour long. It doesn't take long. It's really fun. It's a great time to be together, and we have fellowship afterwards. So you come here at 4 and just sing the old hymns that we grew up with. That'd be great. We'd love to have you come. And then, ladies, a special thing in there for you guys. Every Friday at 10, there's a group to get together with no agenda outside of drinking coffee and laughing together, all right? All of us can use that. So if you guys want to just join them at Bedhead Coffee, 10 o'clock, every Friday morning. I know they'd greatly appreciate you coming to that. It's just a great time. Rachel updated some mailboxes this week. She's got the information in the bulletin on that. If you don't have a mailbox or aren't sure if you have a mailbox, we encourage you to just kind of trickle around the corner here to the right, and you're going to see some mailboxes down the little hallway, and there's going to be a sheet of paper on the wall in alphabetical order with names, okay? So if your name is on it, it means you have a mailbox here at church, and that means there's going to be some materials in that mailbox possibly for you as well, the newsletter, things like that. We want you to get it. We want you to read it. It's going to kind of keep you updated what's going on here at Grace, so be sure to check that thing out. The missions committee has a thank you in there, and there's some, uh, they're looking for some more volunteers as well. The audiovisual ministry is looking for some help. If you're interested in learning how to run the soundboard, so teenage boys, if any of you guys are interested in learning how to run the soundboard or anything like that, we'd love to have some help with that. So if anybody wants to serve in that ministry, we, we need to help you contact Pastor Eric on those things. There's a special announcement in there about a wedding vow renewal on June 13 at 3 here at Grace. We want you to come to that as well. Jeff and Vicki are inviting you to be part of that in their lives, and it's going to be a great time together. We're going to have a wonderful time. So I just hope you guys can come to that one on June 13 at 3 o'clock to be aware of that. And then, of course, June 27 is an outdoor worship service. So be planning for that one. It's just a couple miles outside of town. It's not very far. If you need to carpool or somebody, let me know. We're going to have a group that's going to meet here and drive out. We probably won't start the service until about 1030 out there. So we'll start a little bit later, and then we're just going to have lunch afterwards. So be aware of those things. As far as some prayer items, last night we took to Omaha our five-day club team. Uh, Eden, Alex, and Natalie all went out there. They're going to spend a week long. It's, it's from Sunday. They go out there to the camp today. Actually, it's when, they're, it's when they're traveling there. We had to have them in Omaha by 2, and that doesn't work very well for our schedule. So they're spending the night in Omaha with some friends of ours. But they're going today. They're going to be at camp all week long until Saturday evening. They're going to be at camp learning to teach these five-day clubs. So they're going to teach them how to tell the Bible story, how to tell the missionary story, how to do games. It's a very intense training time. There's 120 teens as part of the camp this week. And that's a really big thing as they then go around the state of Nebraska, literally around the state of Nebraska. And we've gone to other states as well. Last year, they sent a team up to Minnesota. And we had some teams go into Iowa, all over the place. And so these are some big things that we have going on. So we want you to pray for those kids. Pray for the 120, but pray specifically for Eden, Alex, and Natalie, who are this week learning to be leaders. That's really what they're doing. They're learning to be leaders. And it's a great time for them to mature, a great opportunity. So pray for them this week, if you would. I know they're gonna, they would appreciate your prayers greatly. That's a very important thing that they're doing. So just keep them in your prayers. Keep them along the media center in your prayers as well. Pray for our five-day clubs that are coming up. Do we have all our locations set, Shannon, or do we still need a location? Okay. All right. So talk to Shannon. If you have... A, a place, right, or we'll see what she, she's lining some stuff up, but tell her that if you don't have anything, if you have a backyard that you'd be willing to let be used for one week in July, and it's going to be from 10 o'clock to 1130, basically, in the morning, they'll, they'll get around 930. If you wouldn't mind just hosting a club, that would be something that would be very helpful to us, and you could talk to Shannon and just tell, hey, put, a, put me on the backup list. If something happens and one of your places fall through, talk to me. That would be really good, because what we do is we basically do a vacation Bible school in somebody's backyard. That's really what this thing is, and it's, we scatter them all over. We've done three normally every week. We'll do them. We'll have two here in town, and then we had one last year we had in Palmer as well, and that was an amazing thing. I remember Eden was talking about the one in Palmer where we had one kid come, and she said it was so discouraging, and then on Friday, that one child placed her faith in Christ, and Eden said it was just a reminder to me that it doesn't matter how many come. They all need to hear, and just that one was worth it, and it was just such a great lesson my little girl for all of us, really, as we sit there and think about that. So you guys have an opportunity to invest eternally in somebody's lives and get to see our own kids here at church growing up and what they're doing. And it's just amazing to see them work and minister together. So you'd be willing to be part of that. Talk to Shannon, and I know she'd love to, love to plug you in with that. So before we get going on our, on our message this morning, I do want to go ahead and just pray for these things that we talked about and just ask God to be with our time together. Lord, we're getting ready to dive into your word. And there are a lot of things in your word that, wow, this is just, it's incredible to think about. 
Lord, I pray that you would help us today. Be with our hearts. Be with where we are as people, Father, knowing that we all have different hurts. We all have different things we're going through, different struggles. And so, God, not knowing where everyone is today, I pray that you would minister to them in the way that they need to be ministered to. Lord, help them to be able to feel your presence today in their lives. Be with me as I present your word. Lord, help me to be able to say this well, to communicate well what you've given to me. We pray for our teens this week as they are learning to lead. And this is a very important thing. It's a, it's a week of intense training. There's a lot of responsibility given to them. They feel the weight of ministry maybe for the first time. And Lord, I pray that they would do well, that they would serve well, that they would learn well. Help them as they come back to our community to, to make a difference in kids' lives this summer. I pray for our five-day clubs. Lord, I pray that you would use them for your glory. Help us as a church as we have a lot of things going on this summer, ways we're trying to reach out to the community, ways we're trying to encourage one another. God, help us with this. Help us to do it well for your glory. We are a family here. Yes, we're a little dysfunctional sometimes, but we're still a family, and we love you, and we love each other, and I pray we would do those things well. God, help us to just be a light in this community. Father, I, I just praise you again for bringing us together. I thank you for this time together today. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, I was not able to be here. I picked up a stomach bug last week. So if you think, Pastor, you're looking a little bit trimmer. Yes, I lost seven pounds in one week. So my goal this week is to gain it all back. <laughs> all right? I'm on a mission. I think I can make it. But yes, it was, a, it was a crazy week. I appreciate the deacons filling in. I do. I appreciate that a lot. There, there was a concern, though, if I can express something. Last week, I appreciate you know what Zach was saying about respecting the leadership and things like that, but he disrespected my jokes. <laughs> How can you respect the leadership and disrespect their jokes? I don't know. We're working on that. He should be able to take communion next week with us. We should be fine, <laughs> um, but we're working on that. Zach, do you, do you know what Boaz's character was before he married Ruth? Ruthless. He was ruthless. Come on. Is that corny enough for you? I can, I can go all day here, people. <laughs> all right, for your sake, we'll move on a little bit, okay? But <laughs> maybe so you don't fire me. All right. We are in Romans. We were continuing on our series in Romans. And last time I preached this, so it's been two weeks now, I told you that I hate Romans chapters 1 and 2 just because of personally how convicting they've been for me. And I got to tell you, we're finishing up chapter 2 today. My opinion has not changed. <laughs> Romans chapters 1 and 2 are hard. They're hard for me to preach. I don't know if they're hard for you to listen to, but they're just hard. It's a crazy passage. Um, so we're going to be diving into that. Romans chapter 2 today. If you want to go ahead and turn there, you're welcome to do so. In your bulletin, there is a fill-in-the-blank outline. If you want to follow along with that, you're welcome to do so also. Um, if, I just want you guys, just a reminder, I've been told that I talk quickly. Y'all don't know nothing, man. Wait till you meet my mama sometime, all right? But I've been told that I talk quickly. What that means is, is that if there's ever something you miss on an outline, just send me an email or a text message or something, and I'll send you the outline, and you can have it all filled in. Or if you want a copy of it filled in, I do have one where it is all filled in already for you if you want to go the lazy route, okay? So if you want to do that, I can do that for you. Just let me know, okay? So we can do those type of things. So it's all there. If I get to going too quickly for you, just let me know, and we'll, uh, we'll help you get those gaps filled in a little bit. Today we're going to be talking about good customs. Good customs. We at Grace, we have some customs that we do. We have some things that we do here at Grace Church. That's a normal part of our worship is what we do. We're going to talk about how these good customs do not erase bad behavior. They do not negate the bad things that we do. And, Ro and Paul is laying out in Romans chapter 1 and 2, he's laying out the brokenness of humanity. And he's talking here, specifically in this passage, to the Jews, but I'm going to correlate it to us as, well, let's use the word Baptist just for kicks and giggles, okay? We're going to correlate the two together. And we're going to talk about how the customs of the Jews did not make them right with God, and the customs of Baptists do not make us right with God either. Here's our idea. So doing the right things or living like we're expected to live is good. But these things don't bring us into a right relationship with God. Paul teaches us in Romans 2 that our actions don't really mean much if they're externally driven by a desire to please man rather than internally driven by a desire to please God. Our actions, and God is the only one that knows our heart, our actions really mean nothing to God 
if we're not doing them for the right reasons, with the right heart. And God is calling that out in Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through 29. We're going to be talking about those things. So a couple weeks ago, we learned that being faithful to our religious roots does not bring us closer to God. We learned that being a Baptist does not bring you any closer to God than being a Lutheran, than being a Jew. Your roots do not do anything in making you right with God. Nothing. Who you are means nothing to God. I found this meme on Facebook. It was sent to me, and I liked it. So I put it up there, bad grammar and everything. I put it up there. Church folks and God's folks ain't the same. Church folk goes to church. God's folk are the church. I think for many of us, we would put ourselves in the category, well, we'd like to say, oh, we're God's folk, but there are many in churches across America today and around the world, really, that are more church folk than God's folk. We go because it's the right thing to do. But that's really the only reason we go. We're church folk. We're not really God's folk. So we're going to be talking about this dichotomy today just a little bit. All right. And today, we're going to learn that being faithful to our religious customs does not bring us closer to God. Your religious roots do not bring you closer to God. Your religious customs do not bring you close to God. So what are we talking about here? Well, Paul addresses... In Romans chapter 2, he addresses this. He says this, For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. Now we're not going to get descriptive here. We're going to talk about this from the Jews' perspective. Circumcision was a very important thing for Jews. It was a very important thing for them. It's marked who they were, literally. To the Jews, circumcision was a sign of a right relationship with God. You could be brought in, you could be grafted in. The Levitical law, you can see where God gave, gave room for people who on the outside to become quote-unquote Jews through the rite of circumcision. It was one of their ways of becoming, this was our symbol of being in a right relationship with God. That's what circumcision was. Circumcision symbolized consecration to God, and it naturally became a mark of Israel's distinctiveness. On the contrary, uncircumcision represented the Gentiles, those outside the covenant with God. So if you wanted to be in right relationship with God, you were going to be circumcised. That was how it was. For them, circumcision was a very important thing. Metaphorically, the initiation rite of circumcision can signify purity, holiness, and the love of God. Metaphorically, all right? But this was important to them because to have this, to have circumcision meant that, you know what, as a Jew, hey, I'm pure, I'm holy, I'm in God's love, I'm where I'm supposed to be. Why? Because I'm circumcised because I'm a Jew this custom that we do. This is similar to how we view baptism today. Metaphorically, let's think about this for just a second. How do we as a Baptist church, how do we view baptism today? Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, and he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. So when you placed your faith in Jesus, you were turning away from the previous beliefs repenting of your previous beliefs, being baptized as a symbol of that repentance, of that turning away, because you are now a follower of Jesus. It was identification. You are identifying yourself with Christ. That's what baptism was. It was a method of identification, just like circumcision was a method of identification. Baptism becomes a method of identification. It's an act of obedience to our Savior, expressing our desire to please God. Again, the same thing, pretty much like circumcision was for the Jews. That's what baptism is for many of us today, all right? And although Jesus himself did not baptize, the early church adopted baptism as a sign of initiation into repentance and faith. So again, it's a symbol. It's a metaphorical symbol, that relationship with God. And just as the Jews saw saw the circumcision as a sign of purity and holiness, we can associate baptism with that as well. It's a symbol of purity and holiness. But just as circumcision did not make you pure and whole, baptism does not make you pure and whole. More on that in a minute. We also see communion as this way. Baptism and communion. These are some good customs that we as a church do. Biblical customs. Nothing wrong with them. They're biblical customs. The Bible's teaching on the Lord's Supper is found in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34, and it promotes participation for believers who are walking in fellowship with the Lord. So baptism is for those who are new believers or those who want to, at any point in their life, identify with Christ. Communion is something for those who are already believers as well, but for those who are, see themselves as right relationship with God, as a right fellowship with God. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. 
let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. The Apostle Paul is very clear here that communion is for those who are in right fellowship with God and that we should examine ourselves to make sure we are in right fellowship with God prior to taking communion. We're having communion here at the church next week. It's the first Sunday in June, and as our tradition is on the first Sunday, that is our custom, we will take communion together. It's a good custom. It's not a bad custom. It's a good thing. But there's a warning associated with that that sometimes we miss a little bit. That communion is for those who are in right fellowship with God. So, here we go. Our good customs. Baptism, communion, good customs. But what's this bad behavior thing? Paul goes on and he talks about this. He says, circumcision indeed is a value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Verse 26. So if a man is uncircumcised, who is uncircumcised, keeps the precepts of the law, will not his circumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. He says in verse 25, Circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Your customs are of value if, if you're doing what God wants you to do. But if you're not doing what God wants you to do, your customs are of no value. This is what Romans chapter 2 is telling us. We just got done talking about how our religious roots are of no value if we're not doing what God wants us to do. And now our customs are of no value if we're not doing what God wants us to do. Our customs are good. By themselves, they do not bring us closer to God. They don't. Customs are good. Absolutely, they're good. But in and of themselves, it does nothing for us. Circumcision indeed is a value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. It is of no value to God. So, our customs are good, but pairing good customs with bad behavior leads to condemnation from outsiders. Paul spells this out even more. He begins to, to throw things at us now, and throw some things at us that we don't like to think about a little bit. When he says that your good customs... Paired up with your bad behavior, it's going to lead to condemnation from outsiders. Here's what he says. If a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? In other words, isn't he going to be more right with God than you are, even though he hasn't done your custom? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. He will condemn you. Now, this is something that we, as we sit and think about, about history, about our background and things like that, there are individuals, and I think we can relate to this, Baptists, by and large, do not necessarily have a good reputation in the culture today. Since years and years and years have been viewed as hypocritical, as judgmental, as unloving, um, as w- throw in the adjective there if you want to. Why is that? Well, for lots of reasons, but I think one of those reasons spelled out here in Romans chapter 2. And that the people on the outside, they say, look, you guys don't do very well what you're told told to do. For example, every year we at Grace, we have what's called a biker Sunday, where we bring in, we try to invite bikers to come in, right? Last year we had about 20 bikes show up here. We had a great service. It was a wonderful time. We're hoping to do it again this year. Some of those bikers have told me that in their experiences, they feel much more loved within the biker group than they do within a church. Now that should be to our shame. You know what? I believe them. I believe them. I believe that in a typical church, if they were to walk in, they would feel more acceptance from their group. Walking into an organization, if 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 they didn't know anybody, Right? They could go to another town, walk into some biker group, and probably feel accepted more than they would if they walked into a Baptist church in that same town. 
we are told to love as God loves. We are told to forgive as God forgives, and yet how many times do we not do that? Well, I'm baptized, and I take communion, and we're sitting there shunning the person in the service next to us who's a little bit different, talks a little bit different, dresses a little bit different, but needs God just the same. And that person then looks at us, and he condemns us. He says he condemns the one who has the written code and circumcision, but break the law. We have the Bible and our customs, and yet we don't love near as well as what they do. Now, I will say I love Grace Church because when we had a group come in, you guys love on them, and I appreciate that. Very much so. But you gotta understand that there's a world out there that feels like we we look down on them. It feels like we are not willing to do what God has called us to do. And they say, we do it better than you guys. Why would I go to church? Why would I go somewhere where I'm not going to feel loved, not going to feel accepted? Why would I do that? That's a fair question. And so they condemn the church as a whole. While we're just one little church and one little town and one little state in this country, in this, in this U.S. of America that we celebrate today on Memorial Day, we're one, but we can make a difference here. I pray this would never be true of us, but the truth is sometimes it is if we're honest with ourselves. Our customs are good, but they don't change us. It is. Being baptized is good. Taking communion is good, but these things in and of themselves don't change us. Paul writes, No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. No one is a Jew is one who's merely one outwardly. In other words, it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. It doesn't matter what marks you have on the outside. You're not really one of God's chosen people if all you have are outside marks. That's what he's saying here. You may look like it. You may may walk the walk, buddy, but if you're not talking the talk, you're not in. You are not one of God's chosen people. Chuck Swindoll says this, he says, which would you prefer, an unfaithful spouse who proudly wears your wedding band or a mate who guards your shared intimacy with his or her life but doesn't wear a ring? The outward symbol, is the outward symbol more important than the action or is the action more important than the outward symbol? That's what God is asking here. And God is saying the outward means nothing if there's not something inward. Chuck goes on to say, circumcision and a wedding band have a lot in common. They are supposed to be outward symbols of one's inner conviction. Unfortunately, religion places undue emphasis on the symbol while ignoring what God considers is most important. And that's what we do. I'm telling you guys, Romans hits us where it hurts sometimes. We dress the dress. We talk we, you know, we do all these things but we get here but when it comes rubber meets the road we are not following through with what God wants us to do and then it becomes our customs become meaningless to us so then the question is do we place greater emphasis on our customs than we are on our hearts is that become our priority it's more important for us to do the right thing than to be the right person which is most important and so we accept people who look like us who walk like us We accept those, but the truth is, the reality, we're all just in a downward spiral, not willing to admit that we're broken people on the inside trying to cover it up. We become, as Jesus called the Pharisees, whitewashed tombs. You're dead on the inside. You look clean, but you're dead on the inside. And I hate that. And I hate Romans 1 and 2. Goodness. A Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Did you get that? It's one inwardly. It's what's inside, not by the letter. He says it's by the Spirit, not by the letter. In other words, it's, well, I'm doing this. Here's what God's Word says. Here's what God's Word says. Here's what Check, 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 check. Check all these things off. Yep, I'm doing this. But the Spirit's not there? Then it doesn't matter what checks you're checking off. It doesn't matter. He says it's not by the letter. It's by the Spirit. Is the Spirit working within you? Or are we sitting there, well, I just got to do this, I'm going to make sure I do this, I got to make sure I do this, because if I do this, I'm right with God. If I do this, I'm right with God. I'm going to do this, I'm right with God. Meanwhile, your heart's hard. 
and we're a judgmental person, unloving to others around us. And God says, you're nothing. You're not a follower. You're not part of, you, you may be part of my family, but you're not in right relationship with me because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Let's think about this. I take communion because I don't want the person next to me to wonder what I have done. I know there's warnings in communion about it there in 1 Corinthians. I get that. But you know what? I, I've got to do it because it's the right thing to do. It just looks good. And so on Sunday morning, next Sunday, I'm going to take communion. Even though I know I'm not quite where I should be, I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Because I don't want the person next to me to judge me. Well, you're more worried about them than you are about God. And that's a problem. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why is this a custom to us? Is it a custom because well, this is what God wants me to do, and to honor God, I'm going to do this, or I do this because I look good this way. Regardless of what's going on inside my heart, I look good this way. How about this one? Well, I know I've got an issue with my brother, but, but God's going to forgive me. He's going to forgive me. Yeah, I'm here. I'm taking communion, and, and I know things aren't quite right. But I'm going to go ahead and take communion anyway. When I left my previous ministry there, when I was asked to leave my previous ministry, I struggled with the church leadership. A lot. I struggled. We continued attending the church there for a while, and it was, it was hard. In fact, we were actually asked to leave by the church leadership because they saw us as, you know, you, you keep coming here, and people keep asking questions. It'd just be better for everybody if you just stopped coming. Even though they said you didn't do anything morally wrong, there was just this confusion that went on here. We just, we're going to ask you not to come. That's really hard. To be honest with you, I couldn't take communion for several months. And I sat there and, and I looked at the leadership who was able to take communion. And you get angry inside, right? There's this anger welling up within you. And I came, had to come to terms with realization of this. One, regardless of whether I thought they were right or not, they thought they were right. I could not judge them for what they were doing. They felt that they were right with God. Okay? My issue was unforgiveness, which was my issue. Not their issue, my issue. I was the one that had to work through it, and frankly, I definitely was wrong. Whether they were or not is immaterial. I definitely was. Now, looking back in the years back, I can see kind of where they came to what they came to. I can understand, right? And as I said before by that great theologian, Louis Lamour, where there's understanding, there cannot be hatred, okay? We know Louis Lamour was not a theologian, but he said that phrase, where there's understanding, there cannot be hatred. And I've learned to forgive. Something that does, you've got to do it over and over and over and over again. But I was not able to take communion correctly until I learned that I had to forgive. It was my issue. Not them, it was me. I wonder how many times we take communion here at Grace and we think, well, I'm right. They're the ones that wronged me. They're the ones that's wrong. I can take communion because I'm right, and yet there's bitterness inside. There's anger inside. There's unforgiveness inside. And if that's the truth, then frankly, God says you should not be taking communion. But, 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 but if I don't, then, then what? You're pleasing God? Because you're at least willing to admit where you are? It's not a bad thing. What's G.I. Joe say? Knowing is half the battle, right? And now you know. Our customs are good, but only if we do them with the right heart. Biblically, there are two types of people who should not take communion. The unregenerate and the unrepentant. Communion should not be open to those who are not born again or those who are living in known, unconfessed sin. And I would add something to this a little bit. I would say, or even those who are living in repetitive sin, because here's the thing. I've known people come to church on Sunday morning, oh, yeah, it's communion. Okay, God, I'm sorry, we confess, right? God, this week I, I did this, and, and God, I'm sorry, forgive me for that. Knowing that God will forgive, he does, but with every intention to do that same thing again the following week. At that point, I don't think your repentance is really repentance because you're not turning away. You're confessing. God says communion is for those who are followers, those who are believers. The question is, are we doing, are we following? We may believe, but are we really following? How about this idea, this custom of baptism? Well, I'm getting baptized, but only because my parents and my church want me to. 
not because I want to. I appreciate Thomas Holmes a lot. Many of you guys know Thomas. He's here at church, not this morning, but he serves here a lot. And I talked to him about this this week. And Thomas was baptized here just over a year ago, a little bit over there. He was baptized. You guys remember we still had that small tank, and he got all scrunched. It was hilarious, all right? We had a good time with it, okay? But here's this guy in his 30s getting baptized. Been a believer almost all his life, right? For a long, long, long time. I remember asking, Thomas, why now? Thomas was baptized as an infant. When he was an infant, his parents believed that that was something that you did, and so he was baptized as an infant. And so then as you grow up, well, I've been baptized. I don't need to be baptized again, right? And so you have this, you have this little pride thing you struggle with a little bit. And Thomas told me, he had a friend, Mike, who told him, he said, you know what, Thomas, I actually wrote this down. It was really good. I wrote it down. It doesn't matter what your parents want you to do, and it doesn't matter what your church wants you to do. The question is, what does God want you to do? Thomas said, for the first time, somebody asked me that. Thomas said, I kept pushing back because, well, my church wants me to get baptized by immersion, and I don't need to because I've already been baptized. I don't need to be baptized by immersion. And his coworker said, again, it doesn't matter what your parents want you to do. It doesn't matter what your church wants you to do. What does God want you to do? Thomas told me, he said, it took a while because I'm a stubborn Irish. It took a while. But I realized this is what I needed to do to be obedient. I appreciate somebody who's able to share that. Sometimes we're baptized for all the wrong reasons. I appreciate those who say, you know what, God? When I first got baptized, I did it with the wrong heart. Or I wasn't even aware of what I was doing. And God, I want to fix that. And so as adults, they're choosing to do that. Jerry was another one of those who chose to do that. Knowing that the first baptism was one just with the wrong heart. And God, I'm willing to fix it. I love a church where people are doing that. I come to church because it's the right thing to do, not because I'm growing. I was talking to one of my prayer team members this week. It's a friend of mine. I was talking to him, and we were talking about his church that he's attending, and he was an elder there for a while, and he was mentioning an elder that I was friends with that's no longer attending that church. And I, I asked him, I said, so, you know, what, what's happened there? And he said, well, I was talking to that guy. He said he was an elder, and then, then he came off the elder board, and he started going somewhere else. And he told me, he said, I, he said frankly, I would sit there, and I'm honest with myself. I realized that I, I wasn't growing very much. Okay, now that's an excuse that people use all the time, right? Sometimes church leaders don't like that excuse. I'm not growing, so, so I, I just got to go somewhere else where I'm growing. But the truth is, only you know whether you're growing or not. Only you know whether you're growing or not. And if you're going to church and you're not growing, then please go find another church because you should be growing. To come to church just because it's the right thing to do is coming to church with the wrong heart. I told you a couple weeks ago how the best thing that my dad did for me when I was a kid, when I was 16, he said, go find a church that you enjoy. And I went on my own, away from my family for the first time out there, and I found a little country church that I loved, that I grew in. And it was one of the best things they ever did for me spiritually. And if you're coming to Grace, because, man, I've just been here for 58 years, right? I helped put the building up, okay, all those different things. But you haven't grown in the last five years since I've been here at all, then, man, I'm not the pastor for you. Find a church or find a new pastor, okay, one or the other, one of those things. Please don't find a new pastor, okay, please. I like my job, all right? But it's one of those things. I'm challenging you guys. If you're coming just because it's the right thing to do and you're not growing at all, then go somewhere else. You know what's sad? That prayer team member I was talking to, he told me, he said, you know, I got to thinking, have I really grown at all under the teaching of my pastor? He said, well, I grew up in a, in a Christian church, in a Christian home. I went to Christian school all through my life, elementary through high school. I went to Bible college, and now hearing him as an adult going to church, he said, honestly, I don't know if I've learned anything new in quite a while, but I don't know if I ever will either because it has all that training. That's sad. Because I know how much training I had, and I know how much I'm learning. Now, maybe I'm just dumber than that guy is, all right? Don't say anything, okay? Maybe I'm just dumber than that guy is. But here he is. He's going because I'm not expecting to learn anything. I'm not expecting to grow. That's sad. Why are you coming to grace? Do you come because, man, yeah, every now and then, not all the time, because pastor loses something. Yes, he does. I don't hit home runs every week. I don't even hit, I don't even hit the ball every week, all right? There are times my sermons are pathetic, okay? I get that. But hopefully, at least once a year, all right, hopefully there's something that resonates. 
hopefully there's some growth. Why are you coming to grace? Is a good custom getting in the way of your growth? A disciple of God is one inwardly, and obedience is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. A mature follower of Jesus Christ is one inwardly, and obedience is a matter of the heart. Grace exists to make mature followers of Jesus Christ. Where are you in this process? Here's the dangers. Our customs can make us self-righteous. They do. Our customs, I take communion, I've been baptized, I come to church every Sunday morning, I'm a good person. Our customs can make us self-righteous. Convinced of one's own righteousness, especially in contrast with the actions and beliefs of others. I'm better than that person, therefore I'm okay. We've said before how we're not as bad as the person next to us, but we are as bad off as the person next to us, right? That's a true thing, okay? Our customs can lead us to be self-righteous. That there are those who are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their filth. Proverbs 30, verse 12. We could paraphrase this. There are Baptists who are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their filth. Now, that's taking it personal, so I won't say that, but I'm just saying we could. The self-righteousness. Our self-righteousness, then, leads to what? Self-justification. Because I'm good, then I can do this. He, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus was telling him, love everybody. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, but really, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. But you see the attitude? But he desiring to justify himself. How many times have we not done something we're supposed to do because we're trying to justify ourselves because we believe that we're in the right? We believe we're self-righteous. So then we try to justify ourselves. Our self-justification makes us believe that we're better than we actually are. This is so very true. It is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends who is approved. I added that last part, I understand it, but it's the one whom the Lord commends. We oftentimes view ourselves as better than we actually are. It's human nature, right? I've been there. I believe my jokes are much better than apparently they actually are. It's hurtful. It's not, thank you, Janet. It is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. What happens is ultimately it results in arrogance. One of my, uh, one of my review teams, they were going down through this, and they said, Pastor, everything you talked about, what happens if we get arrogant? I said, I like that. I want to put that in. This results in arrogance. So, and here's how it looks. Because I've been faithful in attendance, my sins should be overlooked. I'm not that bad of a person. I come to church faithfully, not that big of a deal. My sins aren't that big of a deal. I'm going to overlook them. Because I've been faithful in service, my sins should be overlooked. I've been here, I painted the walls in the original building. I helped pay for the carpet, all those things. I've been a Sunday school teacher for 73 years. I've been alive for 62 of those, okay? I'm a faithful person. My sins should be overlooked. I've been faithful in giving. My sins should be overlooked. Yeah, I know I've, I've got a raunchy attitude. I know I'm divisive, but you know what? I give, and so you're going to have to take me as I am because I just give to support a lot of this thing here at church. So don't get mad at me or I'm going to take my money and go elsewhere. Frankly, any church worth its salt is to say, okay, have at it. We should not overlook any of these sins because of who they are. How about this? Because I'm a charter member, my sins should be ignored. I'm a charter member, my sins should be ignored. I'm a new believer. I'm a new Christian. My sins should be excused. Ah, he just doesn't know yet. Or, I'm an older Christian. My sins should be tolerated. Starting to hit a little bit, aren't we? I've been a believer since I was two, and now I'm 92. So don't tell me how to live my life, young man. You're going to have to take me as I am. How many of us are here? As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. I stand before you today as a broken person, too. I've told you before, I'm not a perfect person. I'm not a perfect pastor. I've got my own garbage. Ask my wife. And as I said before, please don't ask my wife. All right? None of us are righteous. All of us are before God, broken people trying to grow, challenging one another to grow in love, because that's what we do. 
And so we need to remember that ultimately our final praise comes from God. It doesn't come from man, but it comes from God who judges our hearts, who doesn't judge our appearances. It's not by our appearances. Two verses, Romans 2, 29. A Jew is one inwardly in circumcision in the matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. And God says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, when they were choosing a king, God said to Samuel, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And let me tell you, that is also true of how we see ourselves. We look at us outwardly. God looks at us inwardly. For a moment, I would challenge you to try to look at yourself as God sees you and ask yourself, God, where am I in your eyes? Dear God, where am I in your eyes? Humbly and on your knees before God, where am I? Father, we come to you today, hopefully with humble hearts. You have said there is none righteous. And so we stand here today trying to justify ourselves even now. Well, yeah, but you don't understand. There's this and there's that. God, help us to walk away from that self-justification, from that self-righteousness. Help us for just a minute to ask ourselves, okay, wait a minute. God, what's in there What's in me right now? First John 1 John 1.8 is very clear. If we say without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. God, what sin is resting in me right now that I need to deal with? Lord, may we all ask that question. Humbly with a willingness to turn. Lord, may our customs not get in the way of having a right relationship with you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise.
thank you for coming today. We're so glad you guys did come. Hope you can stick around for Sunday school. That's where the good times roll. Let me tell you, we have a great time together, so hope you guys can stick around. We want you to. That starts at 11.15. Now, if you'll notice in your bulletin, one little thing down there, there's on the back sign, there's a little thing called a birthday corner, and there is one birthday listed today. Anybody want to take a guess who that might be? Little boys. Eric Townsend. So, since they were the ones who brought it to my attention, because who reads the bulletin? You guys want to come over and help me sing it to Pastor Eric? You want to help lead the congregation? No, they don't. Okay. <laughs> so that's all right. We need to sing happy birthday to Pastor Eric. So in unison, everybody turn and face him, because that makes it really awkward for him. <laughs> this is what we do. <laughs> yeah, he likes it. All right. Yes, dear. It's Larry's birthday, too. Okay, I shouldn't have said that out loud. Sorry. We have a guest today. Please don't turn to make him uncomfortable, all right? But you can shake his hand afterwards. He's make him uncomfortable, Mark says. All right, so it's Mark's guest, so I, I guess. No, sorry, Larry. But we're going to pick on him for just a minute. We, don't, we love you. Please know that. But we're going to pick on somebody that we know is not going to hurt us. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> feel free to share. All right. All right, who, can somebody help me, because I'm terrible at finding the right key, so anybody, Bridget? Okay. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Eric and Larry. Happy birthday to you. All right. Enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. We will see you guys in Sunday school and next week. Have a great day.